my honour to co-host with um, Professor Cato Regan, the director of the Bonaire, Bonaire Institute of Human Rights, and the launch of uh, Theodore Merrin's wonderful book, Standing Up for Justice, The Challenge of Trying Atrocity Crimes, uh, OUP, available from all good bookshops online, and if you buy it from OUP using the code ALAUTHC. This is, as Ted says in his preface, a book about fairness, justice in proceedings in international courts and tribunals, which, as he points out, are the institutions on which the legitimacy of the project of international criminal justice rests. They always say you should write the book that only you could write, and this excellent and fascinating book is the te book that only Ted could write. He modestly describes himself as a late developer, a full-time academic at 48 and a judge at 71, but actually, watching him hop over my garden wall quite literally the other day, I thought that he's more the intellectual and human equivalent of the Duracell bunny, uh, with more energy in his 90s than most of us have in much younger decades. This book ranges from Ted's childhood in Poland and his own family experience of genocide, his first career in the Israeli foreign ministry and the controversial Palestinian opinions he wrote, his second career as an academic lawyer, and his third career in the US State Department. His fourth career started in his, 90, in his 70s as a judge um, of the appeals chambers of the International Criminal, Court, uh, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And in 2012 to 2019, his fifth career as the president of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. Now, of course, Ted only fits in all these things by doing some of them simultaneously. So since 2014, he's been a visiting professor in international criminal law at Oxford University, where he's a visiting fellow at Mansfield College and an associate um, of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and an honorary um, visiting fellow at Trinity College, um, where Hilary Balding, who's going to speak in a few moments, um, is the president. Um, Ted is a leading scholar and author of a dozen books which range from international humanitarian law, human rights and international criminal law to chivalry and Shakespeare. And if I read you a list of his honours and recognitions, or even just the countries which they come from, we won't have time for the discussion, so I won't do that, but it's very impressive. So, Ted, it is a delight to have you here and to launch your latest book. So what we're going to do now is that I will hand over to um, Dame Hilary Balding, the president of Trinity College, where Ted is also a visiting fellow, and then we'll have a panel discussion of Ted's book, um, followed by Q&A and some concluding remarks from Ted. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this launch of Ted's book, Standing Up for Justice, The Challenges of Trying Atrocity Crimes. Through his work in the field of international criminal justice and humanitarian law, Ted is both one of the most celebrated legal figures in recent times, and he's an inspiration. An inspiration for his accomplishments in the field of international criminal justice, for his humanity, which is a shining beacon against the backdrop of some of the bleakest chapters in human history, and for his lifelong focus on making the world a better and a more just place. Helen said, Ted is an honorary visiting fellow at Trinity College, and he's a distinctive figure, not least at breakfast. He never misses breakfast, um, except during lockdown occasionally. Um, and over the past six years, he's been an almost constant presence, and our small community has been the beneficiary. Ted has an extraordinary ability to connect with our academic community at every level. It's really not unusual for students of any discipline to approach him in the garden or in the quad and ask him about his work. And Ted is generous to a fault, sharing his experience answering questions of law, sharing the human and sometimes lonely position of weighing evidence and applying the law. I witnessed one of these um, uh, groups of students the other day. They came in a gang and they spotted Ted and they said, are you the man on the hoarding? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's a very good photo, Ted, and it couldn't be anyone else. Ted's made this particular connection with some of our youngest students and he lives even on a staircase with them and he has this great desire to communicate with 
the young generation. But he's equally committed to teaching and expanding the knowledge and horizons of experienced academics, government officials, diplomats and decision makers. Around 18 months ago, just a few weeks before the first lockdown in the UK, I was honoured to attend the investiture ceremony at which Ted was conferred with the Queen's Award of Honorary Companion of the Order of St Michael and St George in recognition of his work in the field of international criminal justice. The award was conferred at the Foreign Office by the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Raab, and the ceremony was attended by many of the most distinguished members of the legal community and UK governmental community who had encountered Ted's work at first hand, much of it during two decades at The Hague. The award is to an order of chivalry, the Order of St Michael and St George, and it seems particularly fitting for a person whose love is Shakespeare and who's written in particular about war and chivalry in Shakespeare. There's a paragraph in Ted's book, War and Chivalry in Shakespeare, that seems particularly apt. He writes, Shakespeare's work contains a plethora of fascinating texts, illuminating chivalry and the humanitarian ideal. Perhaps more than anything else, chivalry meant the duty to act honourably even in war. In Standing Up for Justice, Ted frequently expresses his surprise at the turns his life has taken, not least in becoming an international criminal judge when he was 71. And I find a, a short sentence very poignant. He writes, here I was, a person who'd missed a normal education, a survivor of the Holocaust, judging war crimes, something I was committed to doing fairly, justly, and without favour or fear. He is himself a truly honourable man. I'm thrilled that during the past 18 months, including during the various lockdowns, Ted has been able to spend time in Trinity writing this extraordinary and highly readable book. And it gives me enormous present pleasure to be present at the launch tonight. Thank you. So now we're going to have a discussion of the book with some discussants giving views and then some questions both from in the virtual room and the actual room. So um, if I can tell you who our panellists are and the order that we're going to be taking them in. And we have Professor Catherine Regwell, who's the Cicelli Professor of Public International Law um, at our law faculty here at Oxford University. She's a Fellow of All Souls and the Co-Director of the Sustainable Oceans Programme of the Martin School, Oxford Martin School. And we have Shahzad Karania, who is the member of the Government Legal Service and has been in one guise or another since 2006 after a period in the city. And he was legal advisor and head of international law at the British Embassy in The Hague between 2013 and 2016 and is now currently interim Director General and head of the Attorney General's Office, advising on domestic constitutional and international law matters and, of course, criminal justice policy. Um, Dr. Talita D'Souza Diaz is the Shaw Fel Foundation Junior Research Fellow in Law at Jesus College um, and teaches criminal law at St. Catherine's College, international law and public policy at the Blatnik School of Government and focuses her research currently on online hate speech and the regulation of new technologies under international law. Um, and finally, um, Professor Cato Regan, the inaugural director of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights and a former judge of the South African Constitutional Court. I may have got two of you the order you're going to speak in mixed up, but yes, you'll go in whatever order you go in, yes. um, and I will listen quietly until the questions, so thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's certainly the correct order so far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Um, I'm having to peer around the shrubbery to see my <laughs> fellow panelists here. I've been uh, the environmental lawyer on the panel is blessed with a lovely green shrub next to her, but uh, we'll make do. Can I say what an honor, delight, and privilege it is to be here this evening and to speak about um, Ted's book. Um, I arrived in Oxford at the same time as Ted, at least in my second incarnation here. And from the outset, Ted has been an integral part of the public international law team and very much of what was described of his experience and experiences of Trinity is very much the case with the international law team. 
Uh, so it's a particular delight to say that he's fully integrated into the cloth of the faculty and of the public international law team. And I use cloth advisedly because my comments are going to focus on the issue, the uh, topic rather, of Ted Marin, the man, the scholar, the judge, um, and perhaps, if time permits, the born-again amateur Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. And a subtitle might be Weaving One Cloth or Serendipitous Diversions or Windows of Opportunity. Standing up for justice is Judge Marin's third, uh, he has a dozen books, but it's his 13th book. So I'm going to say it's a baker's dozen so that we can all agree. And in terms of these scholarly monographs, eight of them, including this one, have been published by Oxford University Press. Standing Up for Justice is a scholarly, but also initially, and in concluding, a personal account. Well, on one level, all is personal. For according to Talmudic sages, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. This book exemplifies the strong links between the personal and professional experience and scholarly endeavor, which so typifies uh, Ted's work. As he himself has expressed it, apart from Shakespeare, which was love at first sight, my academic interests were close, closely related to my extracurricular activities. I tried to make them from one cloth as seamless as possible. And what a rich cloth it is. What I will seek to do in my time is to locate this latest tour de force within Judge Marin's oeuvre, particularly this baker's dozen. In doing so, I was tempted, as he has done, to draw on the seven stages of man, as they're called, from As You Like It, but found myself confounded by the multitude of stages in his career and the influence which he has had on legal scholarship and practice. So, Ted, we need a redrafted speech, I think, with at least 10 stages by my reckoning. You identified the Marin gap between human rights and humanitarian law. Perhaps a redrafting of this as the Marin stages of humanity is in order. But to return to the scene at hand, in setting the scene for subsequent discussion of other aspects of, of this book and of his scholarship, I'm, of course, following the structure of Standing Up for Justice itself part one of which is devoted to setting the scene. Uh, from roots, the road to judgeship, to from classroom to criminal courtroom, to the subject at hand he addresses, from Nuremberg to The Hague. As we've heard, his early monographs grew out of government legal service and the time afforded by the opportunities which were led to his first major career transition from government legal service to academe. I was intrigued by the account of his first monograph, Investment Insurance in International Law. He describes it with typical modesty as arising from his interest in the law of state responsibility and, I quote, partly to prove to myself that I was capable of writing a technical book on the law. And the answer to that must surely be yes and so much more. He found time to write this during his period as Israel's ambassador to Canada in the early 1970s, which I hope was both an expression of his scholarly bent and the harmonious relations between Canada and Israel, which provided the space also to write and to teach part-time at the University of Ottawa. Here he also published the first of many articles in the American Journal of International Law, which was to become the principal vehicle for his journal publications, with over 100, not just in the American Journal, of course. And amongst these, it's difficult to choose, but clearly his piece on rape as a crime under international law in 1993 and international criminalization of internal atrocities in 1995 are amongst the most significant and often paved the way for future monographs. And of course, he graced not only the pages of the journal, but also its masthead as editor-in-chief in the 1990s. Well, during his time in Canada, the siren call of academic life became all but irresistible. And thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation, a leave of absence was spent in New York where he wrote his second monograph, the United Nations Secretariat, the Rules and the Practice. 
unless you're concerned I'm going to go through all 13 titles in this level of detail, I assure you I'm not. It's to give you a flavor of the early years. Um, this book was based on his experience as Israel's representative on the Fifth Committee, which deals with administrative and budgetary matters, where he became concerned about the growing politicization of the Secretariat, its slide from what he called an international to a multinational institution, discrimination against women in which he was involved in a major case, and the absence of adequate due process provisions. And if these sound familiar in terms of the man that he is now in his scholarship, these indeed have been persistent themes in terms of human dignity um, and uh, the issue of due process. Well, the significant weave of human rights in the cloth of his scholarship arose in part from his uh, position at NYU from 1978, having transitioned to academic life there. Here he experienced what we have probably all felt in our academic life, the challenge and indeed the terror of developing a newish subject. As he tells it, at the time human rights was not regularly taught, though the law school benefited from some teaching of human rights by visiting professors. There was clearly student interest in the subject and the law school recognized a need for regular human rights course offerings. I was asked to focus on human rights and somewhat nervously prepared to teach what was for me a still rather uncharted territory. My background in international law was international responsibility, treaties and humanitarian law to which I've been exposed in Israel. My knowledge and experience in human rights were, however, thin. Well, knowing what we know now of his uh, trajectory and scholarship, this does seem extraordinary, but it demonstrates that we all start at certain stages at the beginning. And certainly that knowledge did not remain thin, and human rights are reflected in some of his most significant monographs on human rights dating from the 1980s, again largely published uh, by Oxford University Press, dating from human rights and international law in the mid-1980s through to his human rights and humanitarian norms and customary international law building on his work with the ICRC. And then I think, perhaps not culminating, but having a pinnacle in terms of humanization of international law in 2006. Now Ted has described humanization of international law as the book that closestly reflects the quintessence of its work. And that the title is reflective of the overarching theme of his life's work which has evolved from a relatively narrow focus on notions of state responsibility that I started with to encompass humanitarian and human rights law and of course his desire to integrate those disciplines. And of course it recognizes that human dignity, that challenges to human dignity arise in a range of situations from normality through to full-blown war and that all of these norms must be treated holistically to provide protection to human beings. It's also consistent with his view that human rights and humanitarian law are not sui generis disciplines, but part and parcel of general international law. He, has a, he is a generalist at heart. Well, Humanization of International Law was published five years into his transition from the classroom uh, to two decades in the judicial court, your courtroom where he embarked on what he has termed the most important writing of all, his international criminal jurisprudence. And this is very much reflected in part three um, of Standing Up for Justice in particular. And of course, what we see here is the, what he's described as the most exciting and rewarding assignment in his life, a change of instincts and of intuitions. Um, but of course, still the opportunity to maintain that uh, scholarship uh, through that time on the bench, albeit uh, with the necessary uh, restraint. So this brings us back to the cloth and its single common weave. Although his career has been marked by serendipitous diversions and windows of opportunity, a constant theme has been an attempt to grapple with the chaos and pain of war. As he describes uh, movingly, War shattered my childhood and imbued in me both a craving for education 
and the desire for the law to right wrongs and bring an end to atrocities. War led me to write my legal opinion against settlement on the West Bank. Later, as a law professor, I taught the law of war. And then, as judge of an international criminal tribunal, I heard the appeals of individuals accused of atrocities in times of armed conflict. Standing up for justice exemplifies the animating principle at the heart of international justice, the fundamental principles of the rule of law, explored in part two of the volume, and the paramount importance of courts and due process, not only in times of peace, but also in times of acute conflict and their aftermath. And I can do no better than finish with a quote from Ted himself, so that we ensure that it is the law and not the rifle and vengeance that rules. And this, to my mind, <coughs> is the animating principle at the very heart of international justice and the principle that has been at the center of my work for two decades as an international criminal judge. Thank you. So uh, it's an honor for me to uh, appear on this panel and to be given the opportunity to provide some remarks. Um, and standing up for justice, I think, really encapsulates us all the speakers have said so far in so many ways who, who Ted is and has been for many years in this realm of international humanitarian law and international uh, criminal justice. Um, I first met Ted in February 2013, soon after I was posted to The Hague to be the British legal advisor there. And Ted was one of my very first calls, and from that from that first meeting, we uh, struck up a lasting friendship, and uh, he's been a mentor and inspiration to me ever, ever since. And we've shared many informal uh, moments, lunches, dinners, etc., uh, but also some formal occasions, and it was a privilege for me uh, to be present uh, when Ted was recognized by the French government, uh, when he was awarded the French National Order of Merit in 2016, and then uh, with Dame Hillary uh, in the Foreign Office in 2019, when he was awarded the the CMG just before COVID locked us all down. Um, in 2016, I interviewed Ted for a piece uh, which I published on the website Justice in Conflict, um, which Ted refers to in the book, and I titled it uh, A Life of Legal Privilege, Not of Politics. And it's that theme that I want to, want to talk about today, and in doing so, I might adjust that title a bit to talk about Ted's navigation of a life of legal principle within a highly political context, and I think a course that's been fought with some personal cost. Um, now, uh, we know now of uh, Ted's illustrious career as an academic, and his writing on IHL and uh, human rights law was my first interaction with Ted's work during my degree. Uh, and of course, we all know and can now read about Ted's life of uh, principle, integrity, and passion for justice and fairness put into practice as a judge. Um, but I wanted to focus today on an aspect of his career perhaps less discussed, which is his involvement with states, both as a state official, but also uh, his role as the ICTY and the MICT president. Uh, so as a state official, first with the Israeli Foreign Ministry and as the chief legal advisor uh, there, he demonstrated his principle and bravery in giving his now famous legal opinions in 1967 and 1968 on whether civilian settlements in occupied territory violated the Fourth Geneva Convention on the property rights of the Arab inhabitants, and whether the demolition of houses and deportation of Arabs suspected of subversive activities were violations of the Geneva Conventions and constituted collective punishment. And it has to be recalled that those opinions were provided in the context of the 1967 war when, as Ted puts it in his book, the future and survival of Israel were very much at stake. And at the time of giving those opinions, Ted was not only of a relatively uh, young age, uh, he was within weeks of having been appointed to succeed another great international lawyer, Shavtai Rosen. Uh, but he was also well aware, as Ted puts it, that he gave not the opinion that the Prime Minister would have wished me to deliver. And here is the inspiration and lesson to all government lawyers like me. Uh, Ted notes that he has no doubt that legal advisors of governments must be faithful to the law and call the law as they see it. Um, and the commitment shown by Ted in these uh, opinions at such a young age and in such a fraught political context 
a testament to Ted's character as a person and his strong commitment to the rule of law, despite the potential personal uh, consequences, character traits that have always been evident in his judicial work, too. And uh, uh, as Catherine said, Ted's talents have gone beyond being a lawyer. He was also the Israeli delegate to the Fifth Committee in the UN, permanent representative to the UN in Geneva, and ambassador in Canada. And while diplomacy clearly seemed like a path that was open for Ted, it's clear from the book that academia before and after his work with the Israeli government was really his passion. And uh, Ted was able to combine the two things when he worked for the State Department and was part of the US delegation to the Rome Conference and then later appointed as counselor on international law there. And I remember when Ted talked to me about the heady days of the Rome Conference, as he put it, his pride in noting that as an academic member of the delegation, he didn't have to toe the US party line, uh, even though the office of Senator Jesse Helms was present in Rome to monitor the activity of the delegation, which he viewed with great suspicion. Uh, and Ted's passion for independent thought shone through at Rome and highlighted his suitability for judicial appointment at the highest level. And uh, Ted, in his very understated and modest way, uh, noted that it was this experience that gave him the higher profile to obtain his nomination as judge at the ICTY, an appointment that he welcomed having spent his academic life focused on understanding the contours of international humanitarian law. Now he would have the opportunity to participate in its enforcement. And it was as president of the ICTY and the residual mechanism for a record number of terms, including holding those positions at the same time, that Ted had further engagements with states like mine. Uh, it was a role that Ted was perfectly suited to because, in my view, having dealt with Ted on a professional basis as president, he struck that perfect balance between, on the one hand, maintaining his judicial independence, while, on the other hand, holding a clear understanding and appreciation that, as president, he was accountable to states, and in particular the UN Security Council, for the broader organizational performance of the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the residual mechanism. Um, now, of course, we can have no doubt uh, whatsoever about his judicial independence. Uh, when I conducted that 2016 interview, it was in the aftermath <clears throat> of the criticism that Ted received following the Perisic and Gotovina decisions. And as he said to me then, and as he says in his book too, he wishes he had developed a thicker skin. And I know it had an impact on him personally, particularly in context where acquittals in international criminal justice are still seen by many as failings in the international criminal justice project rather than hallmarks of its success as a fair and impartial system. Um, but while Ted may have suffered uh, from personal attacks as a result of the decisions he was, uh, he was part of, um, it was equally clear that the decision he arrived at as part of the appeals chamber majority was the correct one as a matter of law and that, all that, mattered, that, and that was all that mattered to him in the end. But when I talk about the less, uh, other less discussed aspects of the role of the president and of, of Ted's work, the accountability that's owed to states uh, as, as president, again, Ted work, Ted's work here really exposed another attribute running throughout his career, which was innovation. Um, the measures that Ted implemented as mixed president have taken the administration of international criminal justice into a new phase, uh, from double hatting the roles of president, registrar, and prosecutor, and other staff of the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the residual mechanism, to the utilization of single judges rather than a full bench to perform tasks, a measure which the ICC has now adopted following a change in its rules, uh, to judges working remotely from their home locations rather than the seat of the court, I guess the concepts we're all used to and now, um, and judges on a roster only being paid for a full day of work rather than salaries. And, and these measures not only created real efficiencies at a time when states were really scrutinizing the costs of international criminal justice, noting that at its peak in the mid-1990s, the ICTY and ICTR budgets amounted to a sixth of the entire UN budget um, in the, in the mid-1990s. But also, as Ted said, they heightened the effectiveness of the tribunals too. And it's instructed that the new Kosovo Tribunal has adopted many of the practices that Ted set in train. And uh, lest it be thought that Ted was in any way slavishly adhering to a state-set agenda, his uh, principle and integrity have shone through greatest 
uh, when he has been forced to resist the pressure that states have attempted to place on him, and whether that was attacks by the government of Rwanda for granting early releases, uh, China or Russia on the Security Council, or Turkey following the tension of uh, Judge Akai, where Ted successfully lobbied the UN Legal Council to assert Judge Akai's uh, diplomatic immunity. Ted could have taken the easy way out uh, in that case and reconstituted the chamber on which the detained Judge Akai sat, but instead he went public at a press conference in The Hague and bef then uh, before the UN Security Council, uh, emphasizing the importance of judicial independence and the rule of law. And eventually Ted felt compelled to make a judicial finding against Turkey and later address the Security Council, taking very clear umbrage at the position that states had adopted in the face of pressure, something which Ted would never have countenanced. Uh, there's so much uh, more to say. I could have easily spent my time engaging with Ted's views uh, on the future of international criminal justice, for example, that he sets out so well at the end of the book. But I'll, I'll stop here and say once again what a privilege it is to call Ted my friend. Thank you. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's also a pleasure and a great honor to be here today alongside all of you to, to discuss Judge Moran's, as I call him, his new book, um, a book that, as those who have read it can see, takes the reader through his lifetime of achievements and struggles, whether as a young boy, as a legal advisor, as a professor, and most importantly and most recently, as a judge sitting on the appeals chamber of both the ICTY and the ICTR, and now the UN mechanism for international criminal tribunals. So as Shinzad said, there's so much to discuss <laughs> given the, the wide range of legal and personal issues that this book covers. But given the limited amount of time that I have, I'll just focus my remarks on three topics that speak the most to me. Uh, and so first and foremost, that's Judge Moran's time in Oxford, which is something that he covers in chapter one of the book towards the end. Um, secondly, and most importantly, the issue of fairness, and in particular, the principle of legality in international criminal trials, which is something that is the focus of chapter four of the book, but also cuts across the entire book, giving its importance. And thirdly, uh, moving forward and building on the epilogue, um, some additional steps um, that I believe should be taken should complement those suggestions that Judge Moran makes in the book to strengthen international criminal law and international criminal justice more generally. So these are my three points. So starting with um, Judge Moran's time uh, here in Oxford, I was fortunate enough to, to, to say that our paths crossed back in uh, 2014, um, as I had the honor uh, of being part of his first cohort of students um, on the BCL, or MDUR, uh, course on international criminal law, uh, which was offered for the very first time, thanks to you. Um, and um, then again, in 2016 and 17, I had the privilege of being uh, one of the subject tutors, uh, teaching alongside him. So it's been a fascinating experience to me as a student, as a, as a co-teacher, and overall it's been very eye-opening to me personally because coming from a civil law jurisdiction um, and very much neglecting the role of customary international law generally, um, the course and the whole experience really opened uh, my eyes to the role of customary international law, to the formation of international criminal law, and ironically, and I'll get back to this later, um, how customary international law is important to uphold the principle of legality in international criminal law. Uh, and it also taught me the importance of judicial decisions, something that civil lawyers also tend to ignore <laughs> um, generally in the interpretation and the identification of the law, and also the importance of understanding individual cases, which is something that Judge Moran always, always stressed during his classes, and I really appreciate that. Because without understanding the cases, we can't grasp the severity of the events that actually happened to 
actual people of flesh and bone. They're not just cases. And it's only by understanding and reading these cases that we can understand the position of individual accused persons and also the position of individual victims and their suffering. So this was a fascinating journey for me and um, the book really captures it. And it really took me back to those years <laughs> when I was uh, still a student of intense learning and, and creativity. And the years that made me who I am today, actually. Um, so um, the fact that I stayed in Oxford uh, doing a, a DPhil or a PhD in international criminal law and in legality, on the principle of legality in particular, is in no small part thanks to, to Judd Ron and, and his constant support and mentorship. So I'm very, very grateful for, for, his, um, for his support um, and friendship. And now turning to uh, the second point of my remarks uh, on fairness and, and legality or the principle of non-retroactivity of the criminal law. So as the book showcases, um, international criminal justice has been sort of like marked by this constant tension between on the one hand, the urge to bring about substantive justice uh, for these heinous, unimaginable atrocities that we've seen and the suffering that they've caused to victims. Uh, and on the other hand, the need to preserve the rule of law in a more formal sense, and that is to ensure that the law is applied in a fair, equal, clear, and predictable manner to all accused persons for the sake of society as a whole, to protect us from arbitrariness and also to uh, ensure that each and every one of us enjoys individual freedom, right? And the same tension is, is reflected in the contrast between the interests of victims and the interests of the accused and judicial lawmaking and, and strict legality. So those are some of the, the themes that uh, cut across uh, in the book. And, and in the book in particular, Judge Moran shows how he himself uh, navigated through these difficult tensions with the utmost integrity, independence, impartiality, and most importantly, due regard for the rule of law in both a substantive and a formal sense, which is quite rare. Um, and um, as Shinzad said, often at the cost of harsh and unwarranted personal, often, criticism and backlash. So he has not hesitated to acquit accused, to grant them early release, or conversely, to convict or to increase the sentence um, as the law so required. And in and, 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 and all his work, the, the principle of legality and, and, and permeated or featured center stage um, in, in ensuring this fairness and also more generally in ensuring that international criminal tribunals enjoy a wide margin of legitimacy and credibility in the international community. And so as Judge Moran notes in chapter four of the book, uh, the principle has gradually evolved from Nuremberg and Tokyo where it was flexibly applied. It wasn't really a rule of law binding on the tribunal on states. It was more principle of justice. But then he shows how the principle uh, was took a fundamental role uh, in constraining the work of the ICTY and the ICTR, uh, and more recently how the principle of legality is important uh, and quite stringent in the statute of the International Criminal Court. Not without problems, but generally it's a more sort of like a stringent iteration of the principle. And so what struck me the most as a student and what still uh, strikes me today when I read about this, um, especially in the case of the ICTY, is that ironically, as some, that's something that Judge Ron always stressed in his classes and also in the book, customary international law was essential and continues to be essential to ensuring compliance with the principle of legality because it was the one source of international law that was universally and unquestionably binding on all parties to the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, uh, unlike relevant treaties. Um, and so, of course, one might question whether unwritten rules of international law can ever provide notice to ordinary individuals about the criminality of their conduct, right? But as Judge Moran notes in the book and also in his uh, judgments uh, and separate opinions, um, what matters is not uh, a detailed knowledge of the criminal law. What matters is that ordinary understanding that each and every one of us has that our conduct is in essence criminal. That's what matters. And for that, 
customary law will do. And it's even better sometimes than written law. So this is something that is quite fascinating. And, and thanks to him, uh, I, I've been able to, to, to grasp, grasp this, this, this paradox, this, this irony. Um, and so um, apart from the uh, few early cases at the ICTY, which led to an extensive interpretation of the law, uh, Judge Moran shows in the book um, how the ICTY and the ICTR and now the mechanism have uh, strived to apply customary international law in a strict manner and in line with the principle of legality in a methodical and strict manner. And so, for example, one case that really, um, that really called my attention, which is not mentioned in the book, but uh, in which Judge Moran was involved, is the Stuckage case where one of the convictions uh, of defaultation for acts of forcible transfer within internal borders was recharacterized to the less serious crime of other inhumane crimes, because that was the only crime that the accused had notice of. Uh, and also in the Nahimana or media case, uh, Judge Moran's dissent, something that he also notes in the book, uh, the dissent notes how and explains why mere hate speech, which is something that I'm looking into right now, uh, as opposed to incitement to discrimination, hatred, or violence, cannot alone amount to an international crime, whether genocide or crimes against humanity, in the absence of uh, universal consensus on the criminalization of hate speech. Um, and so in a nutshell, I hope that in the future, judges of international criminal tribunals, they resist the urge to consider that justice is a synonym of conviction. And they stick to their mandate, their narrow, modest mandate, as Judge Moran highlights in the book, uh, of applying the law to the facts um, with the same courage and humility that Judge Moran has shown throughout his lifetime. So finally and very briefly, what more can be done to strengthen international criminal justice? Uh, as Judge Moran outlines in the epilogue, we need more state cooperation. Uh, we need more support for tribunals. We need innovative accountability mechanisms. We need more capacity building of national ju judiciaries. We need more universal jurisdiction trials around the world. Um, we need to support regional courts where they exist, and we also need to engage more with the general public, make them understand what international criminal law is about. But in addition to that, I think we also need to focus as much on uh, atrocity prevention as we do on accountability by tackling the root causes of conflict, such as poverty, discrimination, uh, inequality, hate speech, nationalism, in particular by strengthening international human rights protections and educating civil society on, on the importance of human rights and human dignity, which is why I believe we are here in the Bonavero Institute. Um, I also think that we need more diversity and representation in international criminal law. And that includes before international courts and tribunals, whether staff or judges in diplomatic settings, such as assemblies of states parties, and also we need more diversity and representation in academia, giving the role of scholarly writings in the interpretation and in the identification of the law as Judge Moran's book showcases. And we also need more diversity by investing in alternative justice mechanisms such as truth and reconciliation commissions, reparations, and so on and so forth. And this is because international law impacts differently on different people and so without diversifying international criminal justice, we will never move beyond the current disappointment that Judge Ron notes in the epilogue that we are facing at the moment to achieve the level of universal support that we need for the project to thrive. So that's it for me. Uh, looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Well, thanks very much, Talita, and um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. I first met Ted when I came to Oxford in 2016, and uh, reading his book makes me realize the parallels that have existed between my career and Ted's, but there are also some striking differences in that I became a judge at 37, in a sense, before my career had started, not, not at the end of it. Um, but the parallels uh, that are in your book, Ted, really uh, are important parallels, I think. 
So the project in South Africa in 1994, when I became a judge there, was about addressing the evils of the apartheid past and working out how to establish a, a secure constitutional system based on the principles of the rule of law, democracy, and um, human rights. And in many ways, what was happening in the international sphere, in the tribunals when, uh, when they were established and when you joined them, was an international version of how to deal with the legacy of, uh, of evil and injustice in a manner that would make possible societies which would be based on uh, freedom, equality, dignity, the rule of law. And um, so when I read your book, these parallels just, just kept representing themselves. And I really want to talk about two things which came to me uh, out of the book, which strike me as important uh, lessons, important uh, uh, ways of thinking about the challenge of undoing um, uh, legacies of injustice and evil and war and establishing something which is quite different. And the first is to talk about institutions. So it's very clear from your book the importance with which you held the project of institution building. Uh, Shazad has talk and talked about some of that on the nuts and bolts level of making the institutions work, and it's a theme that comes through in the book again and again. When you look, you ask yourself in the very last section, is this project of international criminal justice working? And clearly for you, that working means something more than just looking backwards and holding to account. Is it able to build a society which must be the premise of international criminal justice? And I think what you are right about and what I think you're, the work that you have done in the, the tribunals is so important um, is recognizing that the institution is more important in many ways than the judges. It's more important than in fact the individual litigants that come before the court. It is itself got to be in some way representing the antidote to what has come before. And I think the attention that you pay to the importance of the institutions uh, in the book and in your life is very important. You also acknowledge in the book how difficult institutions are. And again, when I reflected on the difficulties that you refer to, I had always thought from my experience in the first court of the Constitutional Court in South Africa that institutions A are important and B are difficult. Those difficulties, I think it is uh, clear from your book, are considerably greater in the international sphere than they are in a domestic sphere. Despite in a society like South Africa where you're building a, um, a new institution out of people with very different backgrounds and often um, marred by deep injustice, that is a very small set of differences compared to the differences in the international sphere. And you, you grapple with that in terms of uh, different attitudes to judging, different experiences and cultures of ju judging, different experiences of uh, what um, procedure may mean. Um, and I think that these are things that those of us who are concerned about the project of um, uh, global justice need to think about more. In some ways, you know, there's a whole area for scholarship here, which I think is illustrated in the book, and which is very important. So it's not, it's about process, it's about judges from different backgrounds, it's about the importance of institutions and of recognizing how hard they are to build. So that's the one uh, lesson I think that, that comes out of your book and which I think is important for thinking, standing back from the, um, just this, the issue of international criminal law but thinking more broadly about, um, about a project of justice. But the other is about the importance of the role of the judge. And in some ways reading this book, it seemed to me more than many other judicial memoirs that I've read what came through was the anguish of judging. Judging is not actually all about power and working out what the right answer is. It is often an exercise in quite lonely anguish of trying to work out what is just in a situation, listening to the litigants before you, working with the law, and then having to take a decision in a lonely manner, generally, write that decision and then live with the consequences of that decision. And you know, you talk about that, Shazad's talked about that in the book, about circumstances where your decisions have been criticized. 
And I think this is an important lesson. It's an important lesson for young lawyers. It's an important lesson for all of us that actually for many people this project of justice is actually is a very difficult project and it's very difficult to do well. And even when you do it well, you may err and we all have to accept that we may err. And we have to accept that people are going to criticize us and that is legitimate and that you cannot speak in response to that criticism and that is right. And all of these things I think we sometimes overlook in the classroom and we overlook in the legal profession that for the best judges, this is not an easy job. This is a task of anguish and I think I've rarely come across it in a book about judges so well expressed by a judge who is such a role model to many that it seems to me a very important lesson to sort of refer to this evening because I think it's missing in many of our understanding of what it means to be a judge. I think about a colleague of mine who, whose name I won't mention but who I thought also was a judge who expressed anguish and I think he was one of the best judges I ever knew. In fact, I'm quite cautious about judges who seem to find that this job is very easy. So I think for, for expressing that in the book, um, uh, Ted, this is really something very important for people to read and to acknowledge. I also think it's important to acknowledge, um, as, as you do in the book, and I, I think all judges should do everywhere, that it is very important for scholars not to withhold criticism from judging because it's hard for judges that they do so. And I think you would be uh, the first to agree with me on that. I think actually, the project of the rule of law is really built on several legs. And one of them is outstanding judges. Another is outstanding practitioners who are willing to and put an enormous amount of effort into the submissions they make to a court. But the third and the one that's important for us this evening, and it comes through in the book and in fact in your whole life, is the importance of the academy. And the importance of the academy is lies in its serious-minded, rigorous engagement with the project of judging and the product of what judges produce because that it, is, it is that exercise of serious-minded, rigorous critique which makes it possible for judging to be improved. And I think all of that is illustrated in, in Ted's life, in his moving, as it were, from academia uh, to the bench and to some extent uh, combining the two now in his later life but also in the way he reflects on the difficulties of making decisions, the difficulties of getting them right, and the difficulties of managing in a dignified uh, way with a robust criticism that comes at one as a judge. And I think all of that is a wonderful role model for people who are going to be judges and for people who are going to be scholars. So thank you for a wonderful book, Ted. I, I heartily recommend it to everybody, and I very much enjoyed reading it. Thank you. I'm not going to pop up, so Ted, Ted can come and sit here. <coughs> Kate uh, asked me to respond briefly, and this will be very brief, but I wanted to give you some overall ideas about uh, my reflections on international justice and the role of judges. Um, uh, let me start by saying how I'm <coughs> very grateful I am to Helen Mountfield, principal of Mansfield, and uh, to Kate O'Regan, director of the Bonavero Institute, for organizing this to Dame Hilary Bolding, the president of uh, Trinity College, uh, which has given me in Oxford a wonderful home. And I'm so very grateful to her for that. Uh, and I am extremely grateful to all the panelists for their uh, um, extremely generous uh, remarks, which I really do not deserve. I would like to start by saying that international criminal tribunals provide a forum for dealing with high-level crim war criminals. Letting them free is untenable, as is summary execution or perpetual imprisonment without trial. Therefore, some form 
of legal process is absolutely necessary. National prosecutions are a possibility, but standing alone, they present a danger of either pro-defendant or pro um, uh, or anti-defendant bias. The right mix, in my perspective, and constructive synergy between national and international tribunals are, in my view, the best formula. One of the great contributions of international criminal tribunals has been the fleshing out of norms originally set out at a very high level of generality and designed to govern responsibility of states, not individual criminal liability of the perpetrators. They have created models for national jurisdictions. International humanitarian law, as it existed in the early 90s, was quite inadequate to deal with the challenges of trying atrocity crimes. Before the establishment of the tribunals, many commentators believed that the Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions are capable of being applied as is by international criminal courts. Instead, it took the judicial, the vital judicial gloss provided by the jurisprudence of the tribunals to create a viable, a credible body of international criminal law capable of being applied to individuals with the degree of specificity which is required for criminal proceedings. Thus, from a law governing responsibility of states, international humanitarian law acquired the status of hard law applied by international criminal courts in a multitude of cases pertaining to individual criminal responsibility of individuals. Of course, in addition to rules of international humanitarian law governing substantive obligations, the statutes of international criminal tribunals contain provisions of international criminal law, procedure, and due process. International criminal tribunals are unique in the sense that they are standalone courts, not supported by the apparatus of a state not having ministries to support them without police powers or any other enforcement capability. They depend on cooperation of states <coughs> for enforcement and the resources. They operate in a political environment of ongoing struggles among ethnic, national, and religious groups fighting for the legitimacy of their own historical narratives, conflicting visions of rights and wrongs, and competing claims of victimhood. For international courts, this pre creates tremendous pressures for results desired by one party and completely rejected by the other side to the conflict. The legitimacy of these courts, international criminal courts, can only be established and maintained by independence, impartiality, and fairness. They must always remember that justice is not about achieving any particular outcome. It is about pr a principled and fair process that serves the rule of law. Selective accountability is still a political, a political reality in the international community, sheltered by the veto power of the permanent members of the UN Security Council and invoked particularly, but not only, by Russia and China. The United States, too, often, or sometimes at least, prioritizes political alliances over enforcing the principle of accountability. Selective accountability is anathema to the rule of law, requirements of equality of enforcement and non-arbitrariness. These difficulties are compounded 
by the conflicting agendas of um, various stock st stakeholders. I would like to mention briefly three of three such agendas. One, seeking truth, writing definitive histories of the conflict. While the quantum of evidence and the judgments themselves often offer a detailed account of major atrocities, the core mandate of international criminal tribunals is to try individuals according to the law and the evidence. Inquiries outside judicial process, such as truce and reconciliation commissions, are freer than we are of such constraints. Peace and reconciliation. Of course, fair legal proceedings have a beneficial effect on the reconciliation and um, restoration of peace. But if the goal of international justice is reconciliation, and if reconciliation weighs in favor of a particular outcome, be it conviction or acquittal, conflict between that goal and fair judicial process might be inevitable. Judges may not follow any extraneous agenda, however desirable. Removal from the scene of abusive actors such as Karadich, Karadich or Charles Taylor may help the process of peace and reconciliation. And finally, the third one, giving victims justice. Of course, we all sympathize with this goal. But again, pitting the victim's purpose of punishment and deterrence, uh, punishment and retribution may clash with the requirements requirements of fairness and the rule of law. And it does not help international criminal courts that the public at large expects international criminal courts to come out with convictions and not acquittals. A few words to end on achievements of the tribunals. The tribunals have demonstrated that fair international trials are possible. Although they are typically long, and very expensive. They elaborated, the tribunals elaborated norms on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. They established a corpus of rulings on evidence and procedures. They enhanced principles of fairness and legality and brought about a revival of customary international law. They transformed norms originally established to govern responsibility of states into norms governing criminal liability of individuals. They established that most norms governing international armed conflicts apply also to non-international armed conflicts. They have triggered a rise in national prosecutions of crimes, uh, of atrocity crimes. In terms of due process, as well as substantive humanitarian and criminal law, modern international courts and tribunals are far ahead of the proceedings in Nuremberg. Let me conclude with two examples of developing humanitarian law through the jurisprudence of the tribunals. First, the crime of torture. While the UN Convention Against Torture requires participation of a public official as one of the requirements of the crime, the ICTY determined that public official participation reflects customary law for responsibility of states, but not for the determination of individual criminal responsibility of individuals. The prohibition of torture was thus enlarged and made much more effective. But the most singular achievement of the ICTY and the ICTR has been its fo their focus on success in prosecuting and elaborating the crime of rape. What a contrast with Nuremberg and Tokyo. In the ICTY alone, 80 individuals, 49% of the 161 accused had charges of sexual violence included in their indictments. 
36 were convicted of such crimes. In 1993, still as an academic at NYU, I published a piece that some of you have mentioned in the American Journal of International Law, lamenting the state of rape, law which at that time did not even accept that rape committed in non-international in non-international armed conflict amounted to rape. In 2002, I found myself a member of the ICTY appeals bench in the seminal Kunara case, where we determined that rape may constitute a crime of torture, and that there is no need to bring experts or medical evidence regarding the level of mental or physical suffering by the victim. We found the defendants guilty of rape as a war crime. We found them guilty of sexual enslavement as crime against humanity. We rejected the claim that the rape can occur only when the victim shows continuous resistance and when physical force is used. We established that non-consent could be inferred from circumstantial evidence and that coercive circumstances negate the notion of consent. And finally, beyond the Kunara case, to protect victims of rape in the course of criminal trials, we adopted the rules of procedure providing inter alia that prior sexual conduct by the victim shall not be admitted in evidence or as a defense. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and thank you, Ted, for drawing out those important aspects of your book and your work as well. We have got time for a few questions. I think um, Gatri has a microphone who's going to read any questions that have come in from the online audience. And if anyone in the room has a question, if you wave, I will um, ventriloquize it so that the people outside the room can hear it as well. Great. I'll, I'll kick things off with a question from one of our online attendees. Um, the questioner says, genocide survivors in Rwanda have felt that the ICTR and its residual mechanism have excluded their voices and the right to reparative justice and marginalized them in the international criminal justice process. Um, I think this question is directed to Judge Maron. What are your thoughts on the place of victim survivors in international criminal justice generally and international criminal tribunals in particular? You have expressed in the past that the perspectives of victim survivors in the context of the residual mechanism are not relevant to the commutation of sentencing. Can you clarify your reasoning for this and how you would explain to victim survivors the moral and legal reasoning for early release of those convicted of genocide? I don't think I've ever said that uh, interests um, of the victims are irrelevant to our decisions. Of course they are, but uh, victims, everybody will understand, their object is uh, very often, if not always, um, punishment and retribution. Uh, these are very important things, but they are not the only things that a judge, in order to dispense justice, um, can take into account. Um, the the Law says quite clearly, we must uh, decide on the basis of evidence which is available, on the basis of the law which is applicable. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, I do not believe that uh, um, we have uh, uh, not given attention to the interests of the victims. This, is, uh, this argument has often been made in the context of the so-called early releases. I realize that this is an extremely controversial question, and I realize that it has been made so particularly pol political and controversial because the government of Rwanda takes the position that uh, early release, releases should never, ever be granted. But one of the elements of law that we judges must take into account um, is the hu our human rights. And um, the fact is 
that um, human rights, uh, I think, pretty universally recognize that someone who has been convicted and who has shown signs of rehabilitation in prison uh, should be entitled at least to have his uh, claim for early release considered. Not necessarily accepted, but this should be an admissible claim which should be considered. I also want to give you a pragmatic um, element here. We do not in the United Nations system have our own uh, prisons. Um, you may have read that, uh, uh, that uh, Karadic uh, is now in a British prison. Now, um, under the European Convention, the, the jurisprudence of the European Convention of, hum of Human Rights, there is a requirement, there is an expectation that a prisoner would be able to ask for a re release. In some cases, we give early release. In some cases, we don't. For example, very recently, we have denied to Mr. Kunara Kumait, you have just mentioned, in connection with that terrible uh, series of um, gender cases in a little city called Focha in Bosnia. We denied him, I myself denied him a release on two occasions, and we have re recently done it uh, for the third time. But human rights law requires that everybody should, at one point, during his sentence, and the sentences that we, that we dispense are extremely long, has the right to ask for early release. I realize that uh, um, this has um, uh, caused me being called terrible names by media of, uh, of Rwanda. There's nothing I can do ab about it. I wrote in my book that I, one of the attributes of leadership which I have never managed to acquire <laughs> was to have thick skin. I suffer from those things. I get those Google messages about what the newspaper called New Times of Rwanda says about me every, once every two or three weeks. Well, what can you do? It's, um, uh, if you cannot uh, take the heat, don't stay in the kitchen. Or take off your Google alerts. <laughs> 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 just listen to, the, <laughs> listen to the why. So um, there are two more questions, and these two pertain to the role of the ICC. The Could first you speak question. Louder, please? Yeah. There are two questions on the International Criminal Court. The first one is Would you kindly comment on the prospects of the ICC based on your experience of trying international crimes, given the rising power that China is and China's challenge to the international legal order? Do the prospects for the ICC look good? And um, a second question on the ICC. Given your vast experience with ad hoc tribunals, what are the most important lessons you would draw to advise the judges on the ICC? Let me start from the second question. I think the ICC has a very good judges, uh, uh, and they are smart enough to look into our practice and our jurisprudence, and they do that in any event. I, I think that uh, Shahzad mentioned the fact that the ICC in the reforms which they have introduced, for example, followed our example in giving considerably larger competence to single judges rather than as previously, having everything decided by a panel of three. I mean, there have been some reforms that have taken place. I think that uh, I'm, I'm sure those reforms will have to continue um, of course, uh, I mentioned the problem of cooperation. The fact is that uh, ICC has not always been very lucky in obtaining cooperation of states. Um, without cooperation of states, you uh, may have difficulties in reaching the necessary evidence. But even more important, perhaps, you cannot enforce arrest warrants. And so quite a few of the arrest warrants of the ICC have not been enforced. This is very, very unfortunate. I, I think the ICC should be the last institution to be blamed for that. They issued those arrest warrants. States uh, uh, 
um, often states, third states, namely not states of the individual uh, person who has been indicted and whose uh, arrest is being sought, but other states also have not enforced those uh, judgments. Those arrests, sorry, not judgments, those arrest warrants. So um, they have difficulties. There is a new prosecutor in the ICC. Uh, he has appeared before me several times. I have always found him very professional. And um, I wish him my very best. And I'm sure my colleagues, judges of the mechanism, we have, um, during one of my presidencies, we have offered the uh, ICC to hold uh, periodic seminars in which we would be dis um, discussing some of the difficult issues. Some such seminars did take place, and I hope were helpful. Okay, I have two, two questions in the room, and then I think we may have to call it a day, because it's slightly running over, but I think it's worth it. So let's should I start here. Thank you. Yes, 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 just ask the question. Uh, thank you very much, and <clears throat> I had the pleasure of uh, being a student of yours at NYU many years ago, and I can attest to the impact that you had on a generation of students who became human rights practitioners and, and academics, so thank you for that. Uh, my question actually relates to um, human rights lawyers and their interaction with, with judges. Um, Kate touched that on this a bit, and of course we, we know that lawyers spend of time doing legal research, research they're trained legal arguments, but they also spend a lot of time shaping the narrative in a way to present to the court that makes their clients um, uh, or presents them in, in the most favorable way possible. Uh, and I'm wondering what, what kind of an impact that has on you uh, as a judge. In other words, do you base your decision on a narrative that you research independently of what somewhat influenced by the way that they shape the narrative, particularly for clients who may not be perceived very favorably. So, so you are speaking of the human rights lawyers who are actually advocates in courts before us. Ted, just before you answer the question, can I can I paraphrase it so that people outside the room can Please do. understand it? So that the, quest, the question that was asked by somebody who learned from Judge Merrin at NYU and thanked him for that was about human rights lawyers and the way that they argue before international mechanisms not only presenting legal research and argument but also a spin I suppose on the narrative and how far you um, depend on the way a, a, an advocate presents the narrative and how far you do your own research on that. Um, um, counsel presenting an argument before us would not um, typically present an abstract argument. He would root his uh, arguments in the evidence that he has, that evidence he will, he would advance, and that would of course be a very important element of, um, of our decision. Also evidence, just to be, to be comprehensive, the evidence presented by prosecutors would equal, be given equally great importance because uh, we have to follow the various principles of equality of arms, and treat both parties uh, carefully. Um, evidence in international criminal courts is presented by the parties. We are not an institution that is supposed to do its own research about, um, about events, but sometimes we have to. Sometimes we have to. And um, in many cases, we come to a situation where um, when the same question comes up again, we can uh, say that we can uh, take judicial notice of previous decisions on the same or similar factual pattern. But um, um, how, uh, how um, people argue a case is very, very important. May I just end this by saying something, and uh, something from my experience, which has never happened to me. We had a case in Arusha and we decided uh, to acquit a person, namely to reverse the conviction. 
as a presiding judge of the panel, I had to read a sh summary, 10, 12 pages, about 30 or 40 minutes. And as I was reading, and I think it would become clear to anybody who was present in the room, um, um, it, it was clearly going towards the reversal. It would be very surprising and most inconsistent if after page five, I would say, but now. <laughs> um, and um, I um, was very concentrated reading the text. I don't look in the, around the room. And I heard somebody crying. Uh, crying aloud. Again, I did not uh, feel like leaving my text and looking. And I finished reading. And I looked at the defense. Uh, uh, table and the lawyer, I believe he was a Canadian lawyer, was defending that person. The moment it became clear that the person will be had the conviction, it was quite a heavy one, will be reversed, he started crying. Uh, I always find it difficult when I, when we confirm a conviction, to walk out of the room as if we stand. I can never look at uh, at um, a person whose uh, appeal was uh, rejected, and maybe it's silly, but I can't. Um, these are sentences for 20, 30 years, sometimes life, uh, and uh, we take these cases very, very much to heart. Yeah. Um, um, you spoke about the agony of judges. It's. Um, uh, you, as an academic, you worry about the accuracy of footnotes, about comments from your peers, about your overall thesis or whatever it is. Here you worry about things which are so much more important. Liberty or not of a person, very often with a family and children, who would uh, probably not uh, be at home in his real home for years. Last question here. Um, hello, I'm Mishana Hosseinun, a lecturer here at Oxford University. Um, I was wondering if you were to don your hat as a diplomat once again, but also as a judge, as an academic, and uh, above all, uh, as a humanist, what would you advise the Israeli government right now to do now that it faces an open investigation into the possible commission of war crimes in Palestine? I okay, I'm, just, I'm just going to repeat the question for those outside the room. Um, Misha Hussein, an academic here, asking Ted, um, as a diplomat, judge, academic, and humanist, um, what you would advise the Israeli government to do? You may give four different answers if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, you will not be surprised that they will choose to pass. <laughs> it would be completely inappropriate for me to give uh, advice as a serving judge mm. to any government, especially with, uh, with my Palestinian opinions. Mm. I don't think that uh, this would be a very good idea or, would, or whether my advice would be likely to be followed. Let the opinion speak for itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you, um, Ted, for um, encouraging us and, and now allowing us to launch this wonderful book here. Thank you to Kate O'Regan from the Bonavero Institute and Gathry and everyone else here for the organisation. Thank you, Catherine, Shasad, um, Talita and Kate for speaking and to Hilary. Um, and uh, yes, um, those who are in the room can carry on and, and ask for more um, questions in private. But for those of you who joined us remotely, thank you. And we're sorry we can't have you here tonight. Thank you very much.